And yeah, so that should be it. That's interesting. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, excellent. All right. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, yeah, admit. Still people trickling in here. I, I won't get uh, started right away. Um, so I'll just go ahead and start talking a little bit about, um, uh, I was trying to think of, you know, uh, what kind of topics we discuss uh, this uh, this month? And uh, I was uh, debating about whether or not to actually do a presentation on uh, on Kotlin. And then, well, I was afraid that might happen. Um, but anyways, I was trying to go through and uh, and think of uh, you know a good topic uh, to do. And then uh, all the stuff with uh, GameStop uh, happened. And I got kind of curious and, um, and I started looking through Wall Street Bets. Uh, I don't know how many people here are, are doing uh, subreddits uh, or I, I use uh, Reddit just a little bit, uh, but I, I, st I started uh, subscribing to Wall Street Bets just because I was curious, you know, uh, about, you know, what are the kinds of things that people are posting up on there. And, uh, uh, and so I found it pretty interesting. Um, but I came across a YouTube channel called uh, Part Time Larry, and uh, this guy is a uh, he teaches uh, programming. He's a software engineer, and his channel is dedicated just to uh, doing kind of like uh, uh, people that are interested in finance and uh, trading and cryptocurrencies and stuff like that. And uh, he had a, uh, a video that he had done on on Wall Street bets and specifically uh, mining Wall Street bets for, uh, for stock information, but he did it all in, in Python and he used some, some libraries that are exclusive to, to Python. And so I was kind of curious looking at the APIs and things that, uh, that he was using. It's like, this would actually make a pretty good node presentation. And so uh, essentially I did the same thing that he did in his, uh, uh, in his video. I did it in my, uh, uh, I did it for the presentation uh, tonight. So uh, with that, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So this is the Wall Street Bets logo here. A uh, little disclaimer, uh, one of the things I want to do is, you know, if anybody has any ideas or topics for uh, Node.js presentation or Jax Node presentation, it doesn't have to be uh, JavaScript or Node specific. Um, but uh, we're always looking for, for presenters, somebody that might be interested in doing a presentation uh, in the upcoming months. Um, with that plug, uh, it's just some full disclosure for everybody here. Uh, I'm not a fiduciary. Uh, please don't take this as financial advice. Uh, don't take financial advice from anybody that bought an airplane. Uh, I bought an airplane. So uh, it's not a good investment. It's not considered a good investment. Uh, I also own BlackBerry stock. And that's one of the things that I thought was interesting about this whole thing was that one of the stocks that was being uh, pumped, was being promoted uh, on Wall Street Bets was, was BlackBerry. And uh, so a part of my disclosure here, uh, I've owned BlackBerry stock for, for a couple of years. And one of the reasons why I own BlackBerry stock is that uh, uh, my company, uh, we're partners with BlackBerry. We're, we're also partners with Salesforce. And so we do a lot of uh, engineering work with them. Uh, we use a lot of their software. Um, and uh, because of that, uh, I kind of liked some of the stuff that BlackBerry was doing. Um, but that being said, uh, 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 like I said, so don't take this as uh, financial advice uh, because if you look at their stock, I bought their stock uh, when it was selling for $10 a share. And then it went down to, last year went down to like $4 a share. And then it went up to like $28 a share. <laughs> and, I, and I didn't sell, I, I held on to the stock. Um, so I still own my BlackBerry stock. I think it's back down to like $11 a share or something like that. So um, uh, let's go ahead and take a look here. So if you haven't seen uh, Wall Street Bets, this is what it uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, it's just a regular uh, subreddit. Um, so if you're not familiar with Reddit, you know Reddit 
you know, the whole idea is that you can create a subreddit for all kinds of different communities. And there's actually multiple communities on uh, Reddit for finance and doing uh, stock trading, cryptocurrencies, that kind of stuff. This one's a little bit more outlandish than the, the other ones. Um, um, and uh, I think their, their motto uh, slogan is that uh, they're like uh, if 4chan had a, a Bloomberg terminal. So, I, so a lot of the stuff on there has that same type of uh, sense of humor. There's also a lot of stuff down here that, you know, some people might find, you know, uh, uh, offensive. Um, so if you're easily offended uh, uh, by stuff you might find in a comment section, stuff like that, it's probably not a good place to, to visit. But uh, I personally found a, a lot of stuff on there to be pretty, uh, pretty humorous. So this is the kind of stuff, uh, when they say meme stocks, this is one of the reasons why. Um, let's try and blow that up. This is uh, the meme, diamond hands. So let's talk a little real quickly about uh, uh, Wall Street Bets. Uh, it started in uh, 2012. Uh, like I said, it's a subreddit on Reddit. Uh, it's meant for retail investors, but I'm pretty sure at this point, uh, a lot of the uh, hedge funds and other investment uh, uh, firms and stuff are, are looking to see what's what's going on on here. Uh, they also had a Discord server, but that's now uh, defunct. Uh, 2020 happened, so uh, I'm pretty sure everybody here is, has a similar similar situation. It's like you might have been working in an office, and then they came in March of last year and said, "Guess what? Everybody's going to be working from home, right?" And you combine that with also a lot of people uh, lost their jobs uh, and they got like stimulus checks. And so a lot of people created uh, Robinhood accounts. And so um, uh, that brings us to uh, today uh, and uh, GameStop. So uh, end of last month, um, GameStop, uh, actually for the last six months, is. Uh, GameStop has been actively promoted by Keith Gill, whose uh, moniker is uh, Roaring Kitty on YouTube. I won't repeat what it is on, uh, on Reddit. Um, and uh, one of the things I think they discovered was that Melvin Capital and a couple other hedge funds had shorted GME. Not only did they short the stock, but they actually had shorted it to 138% or 140% of the actual numbers of shares that were available. So, uh, needless to say, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Needless to say, um, um, I think somebody uh, saw that and a uh, short squeeze was started. And so, a short squeeze is basically um, a short squeeze basically is when uh, a stock is being shorted and then all of a sudden uh, uh, people uh, start to. Uh, uh, start buying the uh, uh, the stock and increasing the, the price. That forces the short sellers to actually uh, have to uh, have to purchase the the stock. So I'm not sure who this is. Uh, so uh, needless to say, the uh, hedge funds uh, had to get uh, bailed out uh, to the tune of uh, billions of dollars in uh, losses. Uh, GME uh, actually went up to four hundred three four hundred eighty three dollars in intraday trading. Um, and then what happened was uh, uh, Robinhood, which is uh, uh, one of the places where people were buying a lot of the shares, um, they got a call, the CEO got a call at uh, three o'clock in the morning um, from the, uh, uh, from the uh, DTCC, which is a group that uh, basically sets uh, the capital requirements. And they said, uh, you guys need to uh, deposit uh, three and a half billion dollars tomorrow. Uh, otherwise, we're, we're shutting you down. <laughs> and it was like, huh, what? And so uh, they had to negotiate with them. Uh, and part of that was that until they could raise more capital, uh, they had to, uh, uh, they had to, I think it was 13 stocks altogether, they had to stop the selling of, or the purchasing of those stocks. You could sell the stocks, but you couldn't purchase them. And uh, of course, once you do that, that decreases demand for the stock and then the price falls. Uh, and now the, the price is down to uh, 
uh, $43. So last time I checked, it was a $43. It may be higher or lower at this point. But, um, but that was kind of like the, the net effect uh, was that, you know, everybody tried to uh, buy the stock. The, the price shot up. Some people made a lot of money. Some people lost a lot of money. And uh, hence, that's why they were having a, uh, a conversation on Capitol Hill today about uh, what was going on. So that kind of brings us to uh, the topic. And the thing that's really interesting about uh, markets and finance and stuff like that was that for a long time, it really was not uh, digital. Uh, back in 2007, though, the stock market did go digital. And so uh, probably everybody's seen the floor of the, the New York Stock Exchange. And yeah, here we go. And one of the things that, um, uh, one of the things that's uh, interesting about that, if you look at the floor of the stock exchange now, it's kind of dead, right? And, uh, and I had a, an interesting opportunity uh, a little over a year ago before uh, the pandemic happened. Uh, I got invited uh, for a meeting at the New York Stock Exchange and I was actually taken on a tour of the floor. And the floor now is basically just for show. I'll show a picture of it here in a second. But one of the things that kind of came out of this was that once the stock market essentially was transferred really over to servers, uh, these organizations kind of cropped up. They're called HFTs or high frequency traders. And so they write software, automated bots essentially that go out there and buy and sell stocks. And uh, there's little tricks and stuff they do to, uh, to try to kind of like front load uh, purchases and stuff like that. Uh, and there's also all these new exchanges that have cropped up. And there's also something that you, you might have heard about recently uh, called dark pools. And all a dark pool is, is kind of like an unofficial exchange. So like Goldman Sachs, a lot of the, uh, uh, the big investment banks and stuff like that have their own dark pools where you can buy and sell uh, different securities. Uh, another thing that's uh, really kind of happened, uh, back in 2009, uh, Bitcoin was... Uh, uh, was, was launched. And uh, since then, there's been all kinds of different, uh, what they call altcoins and stuff that have, uh, that have cropped up. And so that's also become one of the things that's heavily traded now on as well. So this is a picture I took when I was on the, the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And what's interesting about this is you see these little, uh, these little kiosks, these little booths that are set up. Uh, but it's, you know, it's all basically for show. It's like CN CNBC has a, basically has a studio now on the floor. Uh, all the actual real activity is going on uh, digitally. So this is uh, Michael Lewis. He's a former stockbroker. You've probably, you, there's a good chance you've probably seen a movie that's based off of one of his books. He wrote uh, Moneyball and The Blind Side, which are both excellent movies. Uh, he also wrote a book that I liked a lot a couple of years ago called Flash Boys and uh, another one that was also turned into a movie called The Big Short. And what's interesting about The Big Short, uh, there's a character is played by uh, Christian Bale uh, and the name of the guy is Dr. Michael Burry. And Dr. Burry, uh, he's actually, a, he's, a, he's a licensed uh, physician. He's an MD uh, turned financial whiz. Uh, he started a company called Sky and Capital, and um, this, is, this is a hedge fund. And so one of the things he started doing is he started going to and actually looking at these uh, collateralized debt obligations, which is basically, if you remember the financial crisis, it's like there's all these mortgages that got packaged together. And uh, one of the things he did was uh, he found that there's a growing number of uh, mortgages that were defaulting. Uh, he's, there's talk, I'm sure people remember from like 2006 or 2007, the subprime mortgage, uh, when that was starting to become a problem. But the conventional wisdom at the time was home prices never fall. And so uh, he actually went to, uh, I think most of the, the big investment banks and purchased uh, financial instruments uh, based off of essentially shorting the mortgage industry, shorting those CDOs. And, uh, uh, and so uh, he actually wound up making $700 million for his investors off of that. If you saw the movie, there's some drama involved with uh, actually uh, getting the, uh, uh, the investment banks and the credit agencies to actually admit that there was a problem. 
But once they did, uh, he profited quite quite heavily. Um, but what's interesting uh, was that, you know, at the end of the day, all he did was just look at data. He looked at the data on those, uh, on those uh, CDOs. And so he just went through the spreadsheets, looked to see, you know, which, here are all the different mortgages. Here's the ones that are, have been paid on or been paid up, or at least, uh, and here are the ones that are like three months overdue and stuff like that. And we started going through uh, these triple bond rated, you know, uh, you know, financial securities. He saw it's like, mm, these things aren't that good. This is gonna, this is gonna come crumbling down. And, uh, but he found value. It's like the Wall Street didn't see the problem. He saw the problem. And he he wound up uh, essentially betting against the uh, the mortgage industry, and he profited quite heavily from that. Now, another book, which I think leads a little bit more into what we're talking about tonight, uh, was this book that uh, Michael Lewis wrote called Flash Boys. And most of what the book really talks about is uh, high frequency traders and the effect they've had on the on the stock market. And so uh, there's kind of three main subjects that are they're featured in the book. One is this uh, uh, fiber optic line that was uh, that was built between Chicago and uh, a data center in New Jersey. The data center in New Jersey was is where the the stock market uh, the stock market is. So this is where the NYSE, Nasdaq, this is where they keep their servers. And so you know, typically, if you're using existing fiber optic lines, you know, fiber optic lines kind of run all over the place. And so what uh, one investor did was he actually built like the straightest path possible for a fiber optic line between Chicago and New Jersey. Like literally he just picked the straightest path he could possibly pick. And then um, what he did is after he got the, uh, got the uh, fiber optic line finished, he actually started charging people for, for access. And, um, and so what wound up happening was, uh, uh, you know, they were, the idea was that they were going to profit, they were going to make money basically with giving people essentially whatever it was, like 30 milliseconds or 40 milliseconds, something like that of a speed advantage. Uh, they would be willing to pay whatever he was willing to charge to, to use this uh, fiber optic line. And so that kind of sparked some people's curious, why are they building this uh, fiber optic line between Chicago and, uh, and New Jersey? Uh, the other subject they talked about in the book was this uh, programmer uh, named uh, Sergei Elnikov. And he's a Russian programmer uh, who worked for Oldman, Goldman Sachs. And uh, he was imprisoned. And this guy is pretty interesting. Uh, he was a, um, uh, I think he came over here, uh, I want to say probably end of the 1980s, beginning of the 1990s, and, uh, uh, and started working uh, programming on uh, Wall Street. And his specialty really was kind of like, uh, uh, was really kind of like switching networks, right? And so a lot of the HFTs, one of the things that they, they try to do is like, uh, they have to be able to kind of switch back and forth. And so I believe he was a, uh, he was doing a lot of stuff with Erlang. So Erlang, I think was originally written to be kind of like phone switching software. And one of the things this, uh, this guy did was, uh, uh, you know, he, uh, was looking at the, the code, the switching code that uh, Goldman Sachs had been using. And it was all open source software. They had taken essentially open source software, stripped the headers off the top of them, and then put Goldman Sachs copyright on it. And so uh, uh, my understanding is that, you know, uh, when they, you know, typically of open source software, when you make a change or whatever, he would contribute the change back into uh, into open source. And back then, this is before uh, Git and GitHub really kind of took off. Uh, uh, everybody was still kind of using Subversion for, for doing open source software. And so um, he was making, I think about, I, I want to say over $400,000 a year working uh, at Goldman Sachs. Uh, and he got a job offer to go work for a high frequency trader uh, for essentially three times as much money as he was making at Goldman Sachs. So he naturally took the job. And uh, Goldman was a little bit put out that, you know, uh, he quit working for them, went to go work for a competitor. And so they started going through and taking a look and they uh, contacted the FBI to come in and take a look at, you know, uh, what he'd been working on. Cause they thought that it's like, you know, well, he's been, uh, he's been posting code, you know, online. 
And so this FBI agent uh, said, uh, oh, this is interesting. And so he went to go question uh, Sergey. And it's like, what's a subversion? Why are you posting code to subversion? That sounds subversive, right? And you know, for software engineers, subversion is a very normal thing and stuff like that. But if you're an FBI agent and you don't have any background in software engineering and stuff like that, that, that might sound subversive. So he got into a little bit of trouble. He wound up uh, going to prison, I want to say for about a year. And then uh, uh, he uh, won an appeal and got, got let out. Uh, and so uh, he does uh, consulting now. But, uh, but yeah, that was one of the interesting stories uh, in the book. But the main story in the book that I thought was really interesting was this company called IEX. Now, you might have heard of IEX. You might not have heard of IEX. IEX is a company that initially got started as a, as a dark pool. And the reason why it got started was because there was a... Uh, uh, a, a broker that was working for, I want to say the Royal Bank of uh, Canada. And he was going in and making all these large institutional trades where it's like he needed to buy, let's say 20,000 shares of, uh, of Microsoft as an example. And what would happen is when he would go to uh, make a, uh, an order uh, or a, a call for, uh, for let's say 20,000 shares, what would happen is he put the order in, he get 10,000 back at the price that, uh, He'd originally been quoted, and then the next 10,000 would come back maybe a half cent or a cent higher per share. So if you factor, you know, you did that over and over and over again, it's like you're losing thousands and thousands of dollars uh, because of that. And it turned out what was happening was when he was going to place his orders or look up a quote for a stock price, the HFTs would see that there was a quote for, let's say, 20,000 shares of Microsoft. And then they would go out and buy uh, 10,000 shares, jack up the price. Now, that's technically considered uh, front loading. Uh, and normally it's considered uh, illegal to do uh, front loading. But a lot of these things are happening like literally like in, in microseconds. And so because of the SEC reporting and stuff like that, you know, it's not really visible because they take like, I want to say they take snapshots of like every second, but there's really trades happening and microseconds. That's how quickly things are, are happening uh, in, in basically the, the digital uh, security market. So that's one of the things I thought was pretty interesting. And there's like, there's a guy that uh, worked, for, uh, worked for Brad at uh, IEX and he is a Scottish guy. And he's trying to figure out, it's like, well, what can we do so that the HFTs can't front load? They can't get out in front. And he figured that they had about a 40 second or 40 uh, like millisecond advantage or something like that. And so what he wound up doing, I thought this was actually pretty innovative. He figured out how far does light have to travel over, let's say uh, uh, 40 you know, microseconds as an example. And then what he did is he got a fiber optic line and he spooled up enough fiber optic line so that it equaled about that amount of time and light speed. And then he used that to connect the HFTs into their dark pool. And because of that, they didn't have a speed advantage anymore. And uh, I thought that was actually a pretty innovative way of uh, actually uh, basically setting it up so that their exchange would be fair and people couldn't front load. So uh, that was one of the main things that was kind of featured in the book. Uh, and uh, they've since gone, gone public and they're now like a regular exchange. They're just like the uh, NYSE or NASDAQ now. Uh, but they have all kinds of APIs and things that de developers can use. Um, and uh, they, want it, they want it set up so that, you know, if you are doing automated trading and stuff like that, you can use their platform, but you're not going to have a, a speed advantage like the HFTs uh, had at that time. So these are some of the uh, topics I think that are, I think, kind of important for, uh, for software engineers. So uh, most of the data, uh, you know, most of the data and most of the services and stuff you need to be able to do this stuff are, are either online already or they're free. Um, uh, there's lots of open source tools. I'm just gonna demonstrate just a small smidgen tonight of uh, some of the stuff that's, uh, that's available. Uh, many providers have Python, Node and uh, .NET SDKs and stuff. So if you're already you know, familiar with Python, you're familiar with .NET, or you just want to use Node, there's uh, SDKs for, for most of these platforms. Uh, 
uh, a lot of the boards and stuff that uh, that people are using, like for instance, like Wall Street Bets, uh, there's an API that you can use for accessing uh, Reddit as an example. Uh, and so some of the things we can do is we can build uh, automated uh, trading bots. Uh, there's actually platforms and SDKs for, for doing that. Um, one of the strategies that, uh, that people are using is we're using arbitrage to uh, basically profit off of uh, trades. Um, so, you know, these are some of the types of retail investments that, that people can make. So obviously you can buy and sell stocks and different securities, uh, funds, ETFs, that sort of thing. You can also do options tradings. Uh, there's also derivatives uh, that can be purchased as well. Uh, there's something I just found about, about recently called uh, flash loans. Uh, obviously, uh, shorting is not really a retail investment type, type thing, but uh, I'm sure if uh, you have enough money and you want to short somebody that uh, you could find somebody to help you do it. And then uh, one of the big things recently has been uh, cryptocurrencies and cryptocurrencies have become uh, a lot more popular uh, you've probably seen some stuff in the uh, news about uh, Dogecoin, uh, uh, Litecoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin obviously hit $50,000 uh, recently. So uh, there's lots of stuff going on right now with, uh, with cryptocurrencies. It's pretty interesting. So these are some of the services and tools that uh, I've just kind of taken a look at. Um, uh, Yahoo Finance, Google Finance, uh, I believe both of them have APIs and stuff that you can use as well. Um, Yahoo definitely does. I have a, a demo of that tonight. Uh, Robinhood, um, you know, is mostly an app, website, and stuff that you can use for for doing your trades and stuff like that. But there's an unofficial API that you can use. Um, one of the things about using an unofficial API is that uh, there's a chance that it can break. So if you're looking about doing this seriously, it's like Robinhood might not be the best vendor for 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 doing this. There's another one called Alpaca, uh, which is, I mean, that's, that is a, uh, uh, an API and a platform that you can use for, for doing trading. Um, there's another one uh, I was taking a look at called Binance that's specifically set up for cryptocurrency trading. Um, one of the uh, services I'm going to show up tonight is called pushshift.io, uh, and it's actually, uh, it's a big data front end for uh, Reddit posts. So you can go and look at you know all the comments and all of the uh, uh, you know all of the posts uh, that are done in Red up pretty quickly, and that's actually going to be part of my demo uh, tonight. Another thing you can also do is you can monitor Twitter. So the Twitter API has streams where you can monitor you know hashtags or different words and stuff that people. So if somebody's let's say talking about let's say President Biden's example. Uh, you could listen for that. Uh, so there's people that are always kind of listening for like newsworthy type things might go on. And I'm sure that uh, some of these HFTs have trading bots that are looking at Twitter to see what people are talking about and then making decisions and stuff based off of what they're seeing people say on social media. Uh, there's also a library called TA Lib, which is that uh, stands for technical analysis. And that lets you take uh, uh, essentially uh, trend data for a stock, and then it will do some analysis on that and uh, give you uh, results. And then uh, the last part of kind of what I'm going to be demoing today is going to be uh, on sentiment analysis and basically looking at the sentiment of, uh, of posts and then trying to decide if it's positive or negative. So we're going to uh, take a look at that as well. So PushShift.io, uh, like I said before, this is a big data API for Reddit. Uh, Reddit also has their own API. Um, you can use the service, but you're limited to 60 requests a minute. And there is actually a, a Python library that you can use for accessing this data. And um, uh, it's already set up with that, uh, with that service limitation built into it. So when you're going to query data and stuff like that, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, busting your limit. Um, but I'll show you how you can do that very easily in Node as well. Uh, there's three main endpoints that you can use into that, uh, into that service. Uh, there's one for comments, there's another one for submissions, and there's also one just for, for subreddits. Oops. Apologize for that. I locked my screen. Okay. So uh, we're going to the moon, diamond hands. So let's uh, do a quick demo here. 
All right, let me do this. Can everybody see my screen okay? Everybody can. So for this uh, demo, uh, let me do this, let me pull up the code. What I've done is I've created a repo here and uh, I've seeded the, uh, what I'm using is I'm actually using a, a database called the Timescale DB, which is uh, essentially it's a Postgres database with some extensions on top of it. And uh, what I did was uh, I've created uh, some, some tables. And uh, so I have one table where I keep all the stocks. And then I have another table that I'm using for, uh, for mentions. And uh, so if you want to run this example yourself, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a script in here called the import stocks. And what I'll do is it will take these, uh, the CSV files. I just got these off of NASDAQ. Anybody can go to NASDAQ and download like a current list of all the uh, stocks that are there that being traded. And then what I'm doing is I'm actually coming in here and uh, I'm just loading this up into that, uh, into that stock table. All right. So let me uh, come back into here. And before I do this, uh, let me show you how I'm running this. So rather than actually install uh, Postgres or Timescale DB on my, my laptop, let's see if I have this running. Uh, I actually just installed it using Docker. And so uh, in the, the readme for this, uh, I have instructions on how you can actually uh, just set this up using Docker. So if you have Docker already installed on your, on your laptop or your desktop, uh, all you have to do is uh, run this uh, Docker run command, and this will create a uh, this will create a database. Here, it's just creating a Postgres database. Uh, for this example, you can use Timescale or or uh, Postgres. And then um, what I just did here is I just did a check to make sure that it's running. Uh, I'm using a, an application here called uh, Table Plus, so I can come in here. I can uh, I can run queries against this. Uh, so this is checking, I wanna look for a specific stock as an example. Yeah. This is letting me look for a specific stock. So I can come over here if I wanna look for, uh, if anybody's been mentioning Apple, Apple's uh, that stock, I can come in here, I can run that query and this pulls back uh, everything uh, that has been mentioned on Twitter that has, has to do with the, the Apple stock. So uh, run this example here, uh, what I did was, came over here and do, do, do. Uh, I'm using the Twitter uh, SDK and uh, Postgres to essentially go through and look for anything that matches uh, this stock ticker symbol. So this stock ticker symbol is Palantir. And this is a stock that uh, uh, I purchased a bunch of shares uh, lately and it, it then took a uh, $10 dive <laughs> after I bought it. Uh, but uh, uh, what's interesting about this is that uh, Palantir, there's been a lot of talk about it on uh, Wall Street Bets, but there's also, you know, there's a lot of talk about it on, on Twitter. So I want to kind of monitor and see what people were saying about it on, on Twitter. So what I'm going to do is come back over here to my terminal and I'm going to say node And there we can see that uh, some people are are talking about uh, are talking about Palantir. Now, what's interesting about this is if you look at this uh, mention right here, this mention is uh, Kathy Wood. Kathy Wood actually runs a uh, uh, investment group called Arc, and uh, they're considered to be like the disruptor. Like they make investments in a lot of the different disruptive you know companies out there, and I think. This, uh, I think I heard somewhere that they had like a hundred percent gain, like uh, from last year. So they've done they've done pretty well, and so this is saying that uh, uh, they're actually going out and buying Palantir stock right now. So uh, this is a, a fund that actually has a pretty good return on their investment. So the fact that they're buying the the Palantir stock means that uh, they believe that uh, they believe in the stock. So that is Twitter with uh, Palantir. But what we wanna do is we wanna take a look at 
uh, we want to take a look at what's up on uh, Wall Street bets. And uh, so what I've done here in this main uh, index file here is I've created a hash map of basically all the different stocks that are available on NASDAQ and NYSE. And then what I'm doing is I'm getting the uh, last time of the last uh, mention. And so what I figure I could do with this, is I just want to go through and kind of grab all the comments and stuff that people have been making uh, about, uh, uh, about you know, anything uh, that, that refers to a specific stock on uh, Wall Street bets. And so what this will do is this will look for anything that has a, uh, has a dollar sign and then a matching stock symbol. And in actuality, if you actually go and look at Wall Street bets, it's like they don't always use the, the dollar sign, but I'm using the, the dollar sign uh, for, for my example here. And then what I'm doing is uh, I'm using Axios to make a call out to the push shift uh, IO. And you can see I have two different calls here. One where I go back three days, that's if there's no data in it. I just want to go back three days, three days worth of data. Otherwise it just gets the last time and sets that to the epoch here. And then um, what I'll do is once it gets that, uh, the data, I'll process the data. It just essentially loops through, uh, looks at the, the title and then uh, what we do is we take a look to see if there's a matching uh, stock. And if there is, we grab the stock ID and put it into an array. And then what I'm doing is uh, uh, if I find a match, right, if this becomes true, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through here and I'm going to uh, uh, insert a mention into my mention table. And this is all I'm doing here is I'm just uh, using a uh, simple uh, SQL uh, insert to basically just take this and insert it into uh, uh, insert it into my table. So let's go ahead and try running this. And we got an error, demo fail. But rather than try to debug that, Let's actually take a look at the data. So I have in here a query that I created called uh, get the most posted stocks. So if I come in here and I run this, uh, right now this is set to look at anything that matches uh, a misspelling of Twitter. I'm gonna go ahead and comment that out. And let's just run that. And so you can see in here, uh, these two right here, uh, let's go ahead and put the source in here as well. We want the source. So I'm gonna say s.source and we'll come over here and we'll say s.source. And what did I screw up here? I'm grouping by source name. Oh, I probably got, I got source. Um, does not exist. Let's take a look at that. I did have a comment here called source. I do have a column called source, but it's in the mention table. My bad. All right. So we'll change that to mention. Let's try to run that again, see what happens. Okay. So if we look here, you can see that the first two are for Twitter. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change this to Wall Street Bets. I just wanna see what people are talking about on Wall Street Bets. And so if we take a look at this, we can see that uh, the most common thing that we're seeing right now is, uh, is GameStop. So GameStop is getting the, the, most, uh, the most attention right now. And that's kind of obvious because that's, that's been what everybody's been talking about the last couple of weeks. But if you go here and you look at the, uh, the count of posts and stuff like that, there's a bunch of stuff on here about Palantir. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff on AMC, CCIV, uh, Sundial. Uh, a lot of these are uh, grow stocks. These are basically stocks for people that make uh, agricultural stuff for helping you grow certain types of weeds, I won't say which one. 
And, uh, and there's some other funds, Tesla's in here as well. Uh, Riot, Riot's been getting a lot of uh, attention lately. Uh, I think they fell today, but they've been going up steadily for, for a while. So that's kind of interesting, but you can also just come in here and take a look at, uh, at the raw mentions and stuff like that. So if I come over here and let's just create a new query. We'll call this uh, raw mentions. And let's just do this. We'll say select. Uh, let's see here. Select. Uh, name, is it name? One second. I can't remember the name of the table. I'm just going to do star. Uh, mention. All right. And we can run that. And then we can see here that uh, here is basically uh, all these different matching uh, stock mentions here. So there's a lot of uh, cannabis stocks and stuff like that. And then if we want to, we can uh, join that up to, uh, we can join that up to the actual stock. Oops. We'll say join stock S on S dot ID is equal to S dot stock underscore ID. And we'll say M and then we'll I want to add the symbol here. So we'll say S dot symbol and run that. Let's see here, stock ID. This stock ID does not exist. Oh, S, it's M stock ID. Hold on a second. There we go. So you can see right here, uh, now we can actually match up uh, the specific uh, uh, stock or stock company. Uh, if I want to, I could change this to name. And that gives us the actual name of the company here. And we go through here and take a look at that. So I have this set up so that I can basically run it. Um, you know, it'll just go through uh, that uh, push shift IO and just start off from wherever it last ended. And so I can just go through every day and just kind of build up like a database of all these different uh, stock mentions for using push shift IO. Let me go back to my slides. Actually, let me take a look, one couple other things here I was gonna show. So if you're interested in just like being able to go out and get stock prices, this sort of thing, um, there's actually um, uh, Yahoo has a uh, has a library um, you can use for uh, you can use for for getting stock quotes and stuff like that. So I've got a couple here. I've got one here where I can go get the quote for for Palantir. All I have to do is get current price, and then I also have this one where I can go back and get the historical prices. And the thing that's nice about that is, let's say I want to do like a technical analysis of the of the stock. Well, there's that library I was talking about before called TA Lib, and there's actually that's a uh, it's actually a C plus plus library, but there's a Node wrapper for it. And so uh, what I'm doing here is I'm actually uh, importing in that uh, TA Lib, and then uh, down here, what I'm doing is I am taking all the historical data for that uh, for that stock. In this case, GameStop, and uh, what I'm doing is I'm basically creating a a data structure that has a set of arrays. It's almost kind of like a tensor where we've got these uh, uh, five different uh, arrays that we're going to pass into the uh, into the library, and then it's going to do some technical analysis based off of something that's called a average directional movement index. So let's go ahead and run that and see what that looks like. So I believe this is this is get stock price.
All right. So uh, the first part was went out and got the stock price for Palantir, and it's down again today, 25.17. Uh, but then we also did a technical analysis of Game uh, GameStop. I almost said Game Stock. My apologies. And we can see that the out real is this is the trend here is going down. So this may not be actually a, a good stock to uh, to purchase. And I think that's about it for. Oh, one last thing I was going to show. So something else that we can also do is kind of go through and do a, a sentiment analysis of what people are talking about with these, these stocks. And so there's a library that you can use uh, uh, on NPM that's called sentiment. And what I'm doing here is I'm just going through here and uh, I'm telling it to analyze the messages that are being, that are being output from, uh, from my database. And then it's going to rank it. It's going to give it a positive or negative ranking based off of the sentiment. So it's like if people are saying something really positive, that might be something we might be interested in, uh, in investing in. If some people are saying something negative, it might be something that we might be interested in selling. And uh, what I, one of the things I've also done is I've taken the rocket and the diamond hands emojis, and uh, uh, I've added that in there for, for sentiment. So if we see that, we're going to get a lot of additional sentiment based off of that. Uh, and let's go ahead and run that. So we'll say node. And so we can go through here and we can see that uh, we're seeing some positive, some positive stuff here about, uh, about Palantir. A lot of neutrals and stuff like that. So there's a lot of zeros in here, but uh, Apple's getting some, uh, it's getting a lot of love. So to get that data, I used the streaming API that Twitter provides. And what I did is I'm just telling it to look for one specific symbol. So if you wanted to listen to multiple stocks, you'd have to actually set up multiple different streams at the, at the same time in order to kind of collect that. And right now there's over uh, 7,000 listed uh, stocks on the, on the exchange. So uh, that would be, I guess, potentially 7,000 different bots that you, uh, you'd have to run to basically collect that, uh, that data. But uh, I thought it was kind of interesting to kind of take a look and see what people are saying. And when you look at this data, it's pretty obvious from, from looking at it that a lot of this is actually bot generated. So there are people that have already created Twitter bots that are going out that are obviously trying to pump up, pump up a stock. So that's one of the things that uh, is pretty interesting to kind of look at is to see how uh, other people and stuff are, are trying to uh, play on people's emotions. Uh, with uh, by using social media to kind of pump up uh, some of these stocks. So let me go back to slides. So some of the future topics I think we're going to be talking about. Um, uh, there's a uh, hedge fund. It's actually uh, called uh, Numer AI, and it is a uh, open source hedge fund. So one of the things that's kind of interesting is people have created uh, machine learning type models for, for making investments. And you can go to this hedge fund and say, hey, I wanted to try running my, my model. And uh, I, I thought that was kind of a pretty interesting uh, business model. It's a completely open source hedge fund. Um, uh, other topics are gonna be uh, blockchain, uh, smart contracts, uh, Ethereum and the Slay language. And so, uh, next month, uh, let's see here. Next month, we're actually going to be uh, talking about uh, blockchain, how to program for, for the blockchain, uh, how to use the Ethereum network. Uh, we're going to get into the Solidity programming language, because that's the language you have to use if you want to be able to write uh, smart contracts. And that apply, that, you know, the, the, probably the biggest use case is going to be uh, distributed finance or DeFi. But there's all kinds of other things that people are using this technology for. They're using it for supply chain. Uh, they're using it for all kinds of stuff. Um, so uh, there's actually a, there's a, that's one of the, the trending uh, 
uh, skills that they're looking for right now is for people that have familiarity with uh, the know how to develop uh, on for or for the for blockchain. So we're going to be talking about that uh, next month. So uh, I have a, uh, a couple of links here. Uh, like I said before, there's a YouTube channel uh, that I got the inspiration for this from. It's called uh, Part Time Larry. Uh, it's really good. He does a really good job of going through talking about uh, all the different tools and stuff that are, that are available and different strategies and stuff that you can use. Um, obviously, PushShift.io, uh, that is essentially, it's a uh, API that you can use for accessing uh, Reddit data. And uh, um, also, I have this, uh, this whole thing up on, uh, on uh, GitHub, but I'm going to post it on uh, the Jack Snowed uh, GitHub site, so we have it there as well. And with that, uh, do we have any questions? I kind of covered a lot. No questions? So David, I have one. So you were saying you were doing uh, some technical analysis with this. Um, how do you compare, how do you compare what you're doing here technical out analysis wise versus what you might do in your, your brokerage account, say like TD Ameritrade or one of those, um, do you find that you're able to kind of get the same amount of information? Um, uh, is it quicker for you to do it this way versus kind of a, a manual, um, approach using one of the existing brokerage firms? So I mean, basically, this is the way I've been, this is the way I've been investing up until now. I haven't really used uh, a lot of these tools before, so I'm just starting to get into it. There's all kinds of like, uh, there's a lot of charting software that you can use as well. Uh, I've really kind of just scratched the surface on on some of the stuff. If you really want to learn more about the some of the software tools, I, I suggest uh, checking out that YouTube channel, uh, part time uh, part time Larry. But that was kind of a long answer to a short question. I apologize for, for going long on that. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the demo. It's pretty cool stuff. And take no a look problem. At Anybody else? Any more questions? All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for uh, for tuning in uh, tonight. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to have these meetings in person soon. Um, uh, I, I'm hoping that in the next couple of months or whatever, uh, more and more people are going to be vaccinated, and uh, and the uh, infection rates and stuff are going to go down, and uh, we'll be able to meet in person once again. So, uh, once again, thanks everybody for for coming out. I appreciate it. See you next time. Okay. Thanks. See you.